And I think that might potentially reveal some interesting results. So this brings us nicely on, I think, then um, to consider the whole circuit. So the RV is absolutely not an isolated chamber. It's inextricably linked to the, I guess, the downstream sort of venous reservoir, the venous flows uh, that come into it, the pulmonary circulation and the LV by its shared fibres, shared septum and the shared pericardium. And so thinking about the RV in isolation, um, you know, doesn't give us the complete picture of its performance and of the performance of the cardiovascular system. And there's, you know, lots of um, experts in this area that have, that have talked about it quite beautifully. And this article by Pinsky is one of them um, and various others. And the normal RV pressure volume loop will be familiar to us as, again, this sort of trapezoid shape, loss, loss of isovolumetric periods. And we have this end diastolic pressure volume relationship um, and end systolic pressure volume relationship. Um, and this ES is a measure of RV contractility. And then we have a line that goes from the end diastolic point to the end systolic point, which is EA. And if we do ES over EA, that can give us an idea of RV PA coupling, which is essentially the coupling of the contractility to the afterload um, for the RV to work at the um, most efficiently um, and, and to be remain coupled to the pulmonary circulation. And this can be, and there's a lot of work on RVPA coupling in the pulmonary hypertension cohort in particular, and lots of beautiful studies on this. Um, and we can, you know, we can measure it with some precision with, with very invasive techniques, of course, um, you know, using conductance catheters to measure pressures and then IVC occlusion techniques to be precise about volume and then construct these pressure volume loops and then measure the, the, the coupling ratios. So a normal coupling ratio is sort of between one and two. And as the, you know, the RV starts to become uncoupled, it can reduce to less than one. And there's some studies in the pulmonary hypertension cohort that showed an ES of EA to less of less than 0.8 correlates with an ejection fraction of sort of less than 35 and is associated with worse prognosis. Um, there are hybrid sort of single beat techniques that are um, that have you know evolved over the last decade and especially as I say in the pulmonary hypertension group non-critically ill group of course using MRI to construct these um, measures of coupling is quite beautiful and using um, conductance catheters that are MRI compatible and using these sort of single beat techniques and um, it has lots of promise but it hasn't made its way yet to the bedside of course but there are surrogate markers that have been looked at uh, especially in the COVID literature now so there's quite a few papers that have come out looking at RVPA coupling and its relation to you know, adverse prognosis um, in COVID. It, obviously, it hasn't made its way yet, as I say, to be a diagnostic or therapeutic parameter that we can use to target our therapy, but it certainly seems to be associated with worse prognosis in these groups. And um, Jensner and a group of others, experts, I guess, as well, um, looked at this ratio of coupling, which is the tricuspid annulus um, systolic velocity and um, because they felt that one was less load dependent than things like TAPSI and they divided that over the RVSP so this is a surrogate of coupling um, and this has been validated by people like Tello in the um, pulmonary hypertension group or the TAPSI over RVS um, RV systolic pressure has anyway um, and it, you know to correlate that with more invasive measures of ES over EA and um, anyway they found that in this group that they looked at um, that you know, the lower this value, the, the the worse the mortality, and the only group it wasn't statistically significant in was the septic group, which is which is interesting, and I think there's a lot more work to be done with RVPA coupling in our patient group, and so this is one of my interests to think about the RV pulmonary circuit, and not to think about the RV in in isolation, and so we have the the powerhouse or the underdog or the forgotten ventricle, whatever you want, or the the intensivist ventricle. The people's ventricle, as Sam calls it, that's right. And then we have this interaction with the, 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 the reservoir, the, the venous inflow. And um, in that state of the art paper, they talk about using the venous Doppler flow as sort of readouts for RV um, dysfunction. I think that's quite beautiful. So we, you know, if you can, if we can somehow link all of this together to, to come up with a sort of RV phenotype that we're dealing with, we can perhaps target our therapies more. And um, I guess interest in pulmonary artery compliance is also very interesting, but not really been exploited so much in the critically ill just yet. Um, and then we can look at our markers of a pulmonary vascular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. 
And um, we ought not to forget the left side in all of this as well, and particularly the left ventricular filling and how phenotypes with HEFPEF might impact upon our assessment and management of, of the RV that's failing or dysfunctional. And this is a beautiful paper, which I'm, um, I'm not sure if you've seen this, if you've read this, um, Sid, but it's, it's really quite a nice demonstration of the, of the spectrum of right ventricular dysfunction that we deal with. And they talk through two cases, one being that of an RV infarct and the other being uh, you know, a patient with, with RV dysfunction from pulmonary arterial hypertension. And I'll talk through this a little bit. So this is one of our patients with um, ARDS. And um, Sid, I might just get you to talk through what we can see here. So the, this, the left one is the parasternal long axis view showing the dilated right ventricle. Um, this is a bit off axis probably because the, we can see the papillary muscle into the left ventricular chamber, but uh, it's vigorously contact. So hyperdynamic left ventricular contractility. Um, again, this is compounded also by the septal bounds perhaps, um, and bit of it is you giving us a less than optimal, probably chamber size of the left ventricle. So maybe better image will be a bit more um, important on that one. But uh, as such as the heart looks, I mean, the mitral valve excursion looks normal. The left atrial size looks normal. Aorta probably is also normal along with the aortic valve. There's peri pericardial effusion and B lines at the back. On to this one, top right is the um, short axis view at the mid capillary muscle, maybe just the tip of the mitral valve showing the dilated right ventricle and the D-shaped septum in both systole and diastole. Mm -hmm. And the bottom one is the uh, sorry, apical four chamber view, um, which is again showing the dilated right ventricle with apex forming and uh, septal flattening. Um, and and uh, I can't see the tricuspid well, but the interatrial septum is also derivated to the right with the enlarged right atrium. Yes, yes, and that's um, yes, so severely dilated, severely dysfunctional, uh, pressure and volume loaded. Um, can you believe it that this patient had a normal RV two days prior to this? So that all of this can happen um, fairly quickly, and um, I just want to highlight this as well. So I mean, this is again imperfect. Um, we could critique this tapsy all day long, I think. But um, yeah, so anyway, the, the point I want to make is that the longitudinal numbers that we get of the systolic function of this RV and relatively normal. Um, but this is the RV that we're seeing on the screen. So again, just highlighting that point, never take a single value um, in, you know, at face value and always look at the whole, the whole heart. And um, I showed this one already and it's just really emphasizing that. And this is what we saw a fair amount in, in our experience here at Nepean as well with this radial impairment and sparing of the longitudinal function. And um, this, you know, we've known about pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary vascular dysfunction for a long time in ARDS. It's, the, the, the pathophysiology is quite complex, but essentially what we end up with is this, you know, high pulmonary vascular resistance um, through various cellular, molecular, um, and hypoxia sort of driven inflammatory uh, microthrombi sort of uh, patterns. And uh, this is again another beautiful paper, I think, talking a bit more about the pulmonary vascular right ventricular interaction. And the thing that I want to point, point out is that this high PVR in this particular patient group, um, with, you know, with um, often we see this in, in ARDS patients, is right at the top of the chain. And then we get this loss of RV PA coupling. And then later we get this RV dilatation and then the badness ensues. So if we can somehow think of ways to detect this earlier, then I think we're in for a better ride for the patients and ourselves in terms of trying to improve their outcomes. And um, I stole this from Sam. Well, we kind of worked on it together. Um, so this is a patient with, and, and I just, you know, talking about the whole circuit. So if we think about the pulmonary circuit, you know, no assessment of the RV is complete without evaluating the pulmonary circuit. And this is a patient with COVID ARDS that um, was off nitric oxide at this point, had, you know, notching of their RVOT profiles, suggesting significantly raised PVR. Their Axel time was down, you know, 50, in the 50s, and they had severe pulmonary hypertension. And um, perhaps it's in this patient group 
you know, perhaps that have this more pre-capillary element to their pulmonary vascular dysfunction, um, you know, that things like pulmonary vasodilators like nitric or prostacyclins may be of more benefit. Um, it hasn't been evaluated in a, in a large group in the critically ill. Perhaps this is where we might start to see some actual mortality benefit from nitric, but we haven't got any data to support that, of course, just yet. And so the pulmonary valve acceleration time is, is a, a, a very useful parameter in anyone where we're assessing their RV um, function. And anything less than 100 indicates significantly increased PVR. There are obviously lots of caveats to, to the measurement. It's often difficult to measure, um, and it hasn't been assessed robustly in terms of the inter and intra variability, especially measured in critically ill. And I think, again, that's a that's a knowledge gap and something that can be looked into, you know, how good, it, how feasible is it and how useful is it in the critically ill. Um, anyway, we, we obviously measure it fairly routinely in our patients. And um, often the subcostal view is, is very helpful to, to get it. We wanna see this close and click. And ideally we'd have this screen to the horizontal sweep increased to 200 to just get one or two um, envelopes on there. Um, but we can see that pre and post nitric and um, optimization of plateau pressures and things, the um, axel time increased on this patient and um, the pulmonary pressures um, also decreased. Um, Anyway, it's um, something I think to be explored.